Hello and welcome back to Historical Geology. Today I want to do Chapter 9 on the Proterozoic Eon. We'll break up the Proterozoic Eon based on this Paleoproterozoic from 2500 to 1600 million years, the Mesoproterozoic from 1600 to 1000 million years, the Neoproterozoic from 1000 million years to 542 million years. The pro you'll find that the Proterozoic Eon is really has a the longest duration of geologic time. 42.5% of all geologic time lies in this Proterozoic Eon. You'll see that many Proterozoic rocks are exposed and not metamorphosed, so they, we can interpret them more easily. We do find plenty of fossils, microfossils and even multicell fossils, but you'll see that most of them, or basically all of them, are soft-bodied fossils. Uh, we start to decrease the number of these ultramafic rocks because temperatures have decreased, so we don't see the comatiites. We see fewer greenstone belts. We start seeing more of these passive continental margins, which means that the continents are, or the cratons are forming and then they're breaking up, leaving these passive margins. And then the Proterozoic is when we see most of these banded iron formations. Another important aspect about this time is that we're, we're gonna start talking about this this continent called Laurentia. And Laurentia is what geologists call North America and Greenland together. Laurentia, Laurentia also includes parts of Scotland and Scandinavia. We also see that during this Proterozoic time, we start seeing these sandstone shales and limestone carbonate rock facies, again telling us about the development of continental margins and shelves, these passive margins. And then in this Proterozoic time, we start seeing the occurrence of ophiolites and eclogites. And you've probably read a little bit about some of the articles I had you read. But when you start seeing these ophiolites and eclogites, we're starting to see modern type subduction. Again, we're seeing these banded iron formations uh, telling us something about the changing atmosphere. We have this extensive glaciation, two episodes that occurred in this um, neoprotozoic time. And that really developed into uh, what geologists called an, a snowball earth. We begin to see the first eukaryotic cells through a process of endosymbiosis. Then we see these fossils. They're mostly soft-bodied organisms that are impressions in sandstones and sedimentary rock. This is a black canyon in the, in the Gunnison, which is in southern Colorado, the Gunnison River, and it exposes the, these protozoic rocks. They're mostly about 1.8 billion-year-old metamorphic rock, uh, a gneiss, and then these granitic intrusions have cut into it. These are about 1.4 billion years. We find that's a similar thing that we see. So this is southern Colorado. We see this in the Grand Canyon. This is Arizona. So this is a top eat sandstone, which is Cambrian, about 542 million years old. But these rocks, these are the metamorphic rocks and igneous rocks at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Uh, the Vishnu Schist is 1.8 billion years old, actually 1.8 billion years old, 1.7 billion years old. The Zoroaster granite is about 1.4 billion years old, so similar to what we see in Colorado. And then in, here in Death Valley, these are some pictures when I was there uh, last winter, and we see this 1.7, 1.8 billion year old metamorphic Nisic basement, and here's a close-up of that rock. In here, there's also some 1.4 billion year old granitic intrusives as well. So again, a similar uh, geology for the basement rocks. The theme of the Proterozoic is that we had, all, in the Archean, we had all these individual cratons, like the Slave Craton, the, the, the Heath, the Ray, the Wyoming, uh, Superior Cratons. They formed by um, accretion of those greenstone belts and development of those granite nice complexes. Now we have those cratons, and in the Proterozoic, we're going to crash them together. We're going to amalgamate them, and we're going to make larger land masses. In this case, we're making Laurentia. So you'll see one of the oldest origins, and they're called origin. Uh, remember, oro is a Greek word which means mountain, and gen or, or stands for genesis, so the genesis of a mountain. So when these cratons start crashing into each other, they're going to have mountain building events orogenesis. And usually it's involved um, melting and, and plutonism where you're making new granitic rocks, new magmas are forming, and uh, the continents are merging together 
uh, in this fashion. So during the Paleoproterozoic time, we're seeing the Archean craton sutured along these, uh, along these origins. One of the oldest ones is this um, Thalon origin. And here we're, we're suturing the slave craton with the ray craton over here. As we go along to the you know, farther south, we start suturing this trans-Hudson origin, which sutures the superior craton with my Wyoming craton. And it, we're even adding some rocks down here in, in southeastern California. There's a little micro craton here called Mojavia. Here it says it's Archean. There's some chemical ages that suggest that it could be Archean, but the rocks here are mostly about 1.8 billion years old, the, the crystallization ages. It, it, you're suturing these different rock units here, uh, and you're adding more provinces to the to North America, Laurentia, Yavapal province, Mata Mataal province here. That those are happening about 1.7 to about uh, 1.6 billion years ago. And then finally, some of the last events that occurred are where you're developing this granite rhyolite province here, which is pretty extensive, all the way up here from from Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, all the way south into Arizona. So it's a huge province. And it's, it's kind of a strange province because it, it, it doesn't seem to be related to abduction zones. It seems like you're reworking and melting existing rock. So there must have been a higher heat flow here to allow this formation of this granite rhyolite province. But again, these are the basement rocks that underlie all the sedimentary rocks we're going to see later on in the Paleozoic. Going back to that Wapme origin in Canada, that's going to be over here off the, um, off the slave craton. And one important thing, note that it's about 2 billion to 1.8 billion years old. What this origin mountain forming event documents, it documents the, the beginnings of, of these stable carbonate platforms, these continental margins. Geologists call them either trailing continental margins or passive continental margins. And what you end up seeing is a, is a specific sedimentary facies of sandstone, carbonate, shale assemblages. And again, indicating this development of a, of a stable offshore platform where sedimentation occur, can occur. And this is where we find lots of fossils. Going back here to our model here, note that another province that's not shown here is a 1.3 to 1, 2 billion year old province called the Grenville province. So that's one of the last ones to form during this Proterozoic time. And this Grenville province really documents the formation of a, of a supercontinent. And this supercontinent we call Rodinia. And Rodinia has all these Grenville orogeny type of rocks, these really mountain building rocks. And a lot of these Grenville orogeny rocks have high grade metamorphic uh, textures. In other words, they've been heated up to, it's called granulite facies, which is high temperature and high pressure. And that usually happens when you're having continents collide with each other. So in this case, we're colliding these continents and making this supercontinent called Rodinia. Rodinia, here's, there's a couple of examples. In fact, I'm, you're going to be reading a little article, a couple of little articles about how geologists have linked Rodinia, or at least Laurentia, with uh, East Antarctica. And there's good evidence of um, uh, based on this mid-continent rift. So the mid-continent rift is uh, an episode where about 1.1 billion years ago, Laurentia began to break up. So it was going to break apart, break in two, and maybe make two separate continents. But the rift started about 1.1 billion years ago, and then it stopped about 20 million years later. So it wasn't long-lasting. Laurentia stayed intact. But in that mid-continent rift, there's a series of mafic volcanic rocks, mostly basalts and diabase. And they're up here in the, the upper peninsula of Michigan. They're called the Kawinawan Large Igneous Province. And that rift extends all the way down mostly in the subsurface, down into Kansas, and even down into, into Texas. And we find uh, similar rocks in this coastland of Antarctica. So you'll read the article, and the geologists found rocks in, in a glacial moraine, in glacial till that look like rocks from North America. And also there are these things called nunataks. Nunataks are rocks, or really mountaintops that are exposed above the ice field. When we look at continental glaciers, because Antarctica is covered by a continental glacier, the glaciers are, are thousands of feet thick, and so they can overrun mountain ranges. So these are just the tips of the mountains exposed above that glacial ice. So we call those nunataks. But those nunataks, their chemistry and their, and their geochronological ages 
are 1.1 billion years old, same age as the Mid-Continent Rift. And we find those same rocks in, in West Texas here, down near El Paso, in the Franklin Mountains. The rocks are similar chemically and the same age as these down here in, um, in Texas. So that explains that Mid-Continental Rift connection and, and the hypothesis called the sweat hypothesis for the southwestern East Antarctica connection. That, that'll bring Rodinia, at least the reconstruction of Rodinia, bring East Antarctica over here. And here's a little bit of that coast land down in here. So what else was happening during this Meso-Neoproterozoic time? Besides the uh, origins where you're, you're amalgamating these, these Archean cratons and, and then you're making the Rodinian supercontinent, there was some sedimentation. So here's some limestone, some Precambrian limestones up at Glacier National Park up in Wyoming. Here in the southern Rocky Mountains of New Mexico, we're seeing some quartzites and some mafic intrusions. So again, some sedimentary rocks, some sedimentation. One big area where we see sedimentation is the Grand Canyon. So there's a whole group here called the, the, the Grand Canyon Supergroup. And the Supergroup has other groups called the Uncar Group and the Chuar Group. But these are all Precambrian. They're mostly Neoproterozoic, around 800 to 700 million years old. And one thing you'll note, they're shales, quartzites. Uh, that's, a, that's actually a limestone. There's some lava flows in there. But they're mostly sedimentary rocks. And we'll find that they're, they're at an angle or they're tilted to the younger series that includes the top eats, bright angel shale, the mauve limestone. So this, this constitutes an angular unconformity. But these are Precambrian, mostly around 740, uh, 750 million years old. So you, now your text talks a little bit about these supercontinents. So we mentioned Rodinia, but there's some others. So the continents are not just areas above land. So remember the continent extends out into the continental shelf, which is the, sub the submerged edge of the continent. So continental rocks are mostly granitic, so they're more felsic, and they're thicker than the mafic oceanic crust. Remember, continents average around 35 kilometers thick. Oceanic crust is about 7 kilometers thick. Supercontinents, here we have two or more continents that have joined. Remember, the fact that we see these ophiolites and the eclogites, we begin to see that modern-style plate tectonics in this Proterozoic time. So your book mentions uh, ophiolites. So ophiolites, the definition is that they're they're sections of ocean lithosphere that ha have somehow been accreted or attached to the land. So instead of being subducted, remember, remember the ultimate fate of the ocean floor is to be subducted back to the mantle. But this is an example of ocean floor that wasn't subducted, that was attached to a continent. Maybe it formed in a back arc basin, or there were some strange tectonics that trapped the ophiolite. And usually ophiolites will be accreted or attached to continents uh, at subduction zones. So like here in California, uh, during the Mesozoic time, the whole state was a big subduction zone. And we have several locations of ophiolites here in California. We'll talk about those when we do the Mesozoic of, of um, Western North America. There is a definite stratigraphy or, or order or sequence in the ophiolite. So we start off with these, these serpentinites. And what the serpentinites represent, remember, Serpentinite is a, is a metamorphic rock. It used to be, or the protolith of serpentinite, mantle predatite. So the serpentinites here represent the upper mantle. And then this line would be the, the moho, the separation between ocean crust and the mantle. So the moho would be here. But then we have these gabbros, and then we have these sheeted mafic dikes and that feed volcanoes. So really what we're looking at here, we're looking at a magma chamber under a mid-oceanic ridge we see the volcanic dikes, the conduits feeding magma to the volcanoes at the mid-oceanic ridge and erupting the pillow lavas, right? And here's a picture of some pillow lavas uh, from Finland, one of the oldest ophiolites on Earth. And then above that, we see some marine sedimentary rock, so maybe some volcanic rock, some metamorphic rock, carbonates, sandstones, mud rocks. So we see the marine sedimentary rocks on top of the ocean lithosphere. So anyways, that's our definite stratigraphy or sequence in an ophiolite.